this was to show you my BlackBerry. <laughs> I have my own personal X phone, uh, iPhone XS, so uh, personally I'm up to date, maybe not the, my employer. All right, so I'm, I am going to do a deep dive onto several aspects of AI. I'm, try, I'm going to attempt to give you, s everyone in the room, something interesting to take away from this. Uh, if I dive too deep in something, don't worry about it. There will be something else interesting. Uh, there we go. So what I wanted to do was to focus on AI for designing things, things or processes. Uh, it could be applied to many, many different parts of the, uh, many different industries. We'll get to that at the end. But <coughs> I, I did want to talk about AI in general and what you would have heard about AI already. So AI and machine learning has gone through a, a huge rise in uh, awareness and applicability because we've got faster computers, there are some good algorithms, there's a lot of data from the internet. All of these things have come together to make uh, AI and machine learning more usable. Uh, you would have heard about it. So in the finance world, you can use AI to predict who might be uh, a good loan risk or who is going to cheat on their insurance applications. In the uh, legal world, you can use it to try to put read, have the computer read through a legal agreement and raise some possible objections or problems that need to be done. You in the automotive world, you can have an autonomous vehicle that's doing some quick control. Camera says there's something in the way, you hit the brakes. Those are all applications of AI that are becoming real now. I'm gonna be talking about something a little bit different, but using a lot of the same tools. So the idea here is can we use machine learning, but not just machine learning, we'll also have a simulator, something that simulates the world, we'll do some optimization, and all of that put together to help a human designer come up with better designs faster. And down there along the bottom are some examples of designs that came from computers. Not all of them use machine learning yet. The one on the left there is Autodesk. They have a tool called Generative Design. And it's all about, in this case, light weighting automotive parts. So you want an automotive part that does a particular function. It's a chassis for a vehicle, but you don't want as much metal as, uh, as the current cars have. So we'll do this generative design. And it's mostly just optimization, not so much machine learning yet. NASA wanted to send up some antennas on, on the space shuttle. They wanted those ant antennas to have certain properties and they used a computer to help optimize it. And the result is not something that people would necessarily think of. Uh, you just use a computer to search a whole bunch of different uh, designs. The one on the far right is a photonic device. So photonics is where you're using light as a kind of, uh, as a way of com communicating information. <coughs> when we communicate to Europe, it's on fiber optics and that fiber optic cable carries the information. So this is a device that takes the output of a fiber optic device, uh, of a, f a fiber and uh, divides the wavelength <coughs> because different wavelengths might be carrying different information. But it's weird looking. It's not what a human designer would have come up with uh, this is the smallest device that does this. And it was done using a computer with some machine learning. Okay, so let's think about this very simply. If you're at a science museum and you're a, a, a kid, you're 14 years old, you might have been given the task of building a bridge out of gumdrops and uh, toothpicks. You've got a six inch gap and you're told you're gonna be putting a whole bunch of chunks of metal on this bridge and it has to hold up. If it holds up, then you win all the gumdrops. I don't know what the, the prize is. Uh, okay, so this, this task, if you have a group of kids sitting down and trying to build this bridge, they're gonna try three, maybe four designs and whatever the best one is that they've done, that's what they'll propose. But suppose they had a computer in the background with some past designs it also uh, simulates all of the forces on the bridge that's been designed so that you can say, oh, this one's not gonna work right away, just inside the computer. And it's running through a whole bunch of these really, really fast and then presents to the kids, 
well, here are maybe 10 designs that might uh, work. And then the kids say, well, that one looks nice, or whatever the, the, their choice is based on. And you're going to get a better bridge out of that collaboration between the kids and the computer. Where's the machine learning? Well, let's, if you think about in the kids' case, you could tell the kids, build a bridge over the six-inch gap. And then a couple hours later, we tested it all, and you give them a new task of a 12-inch gap. They've learned stuff from that first uh, exercise that don't put too many toothpicks into the same gumdrop, uh, triangles are strong, uh, tetrahedra are even stronger, so they might be able to do this with a longer gap because of that learning. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Can we get the computer to help with the optimization, searching more and more of these possible designs, as well as learning about the process as it's going? So that <coughs> thinking about this from a computer science point of view, you start throwing away everything that doesn't matter. What matters uh, in figuring out how many, how much designing can we do in a certain amount of time? Well, what, what's going to matter is how long does it take to check each of the des designs? In the real world, te testing each one of those bridges is going to take several minutes. In a computer simulation, it might take seconds. Okay, so that's one way to speed it up. Uh, we also care about how many different uh, ways are there to do one of the things that you have to do? So uh, uh, you, you uh, want to know how wide the bridge might be uh, and, and how long the bridge might be. Those are two different variables. How many different lengths are you going to consider? How many different widths? Also, how many variables altogether are you going to consider? Uh, and so if you're a computer scientist, then this is big old notation that just tells you about how long it's going to take to figure this all out. <coughs> and we can start, th so this is a schematic of what I've already been talking about. You could have the bridge designer in the world doing the, a human, doing a search. Uh, in, and it might be a bridge, it might be anything. You'll see later that a lot of what I'm saying, of, of course, applies to many different uh, sectors. Then in addition to the human trying this with a whole bunch of input variables and, and the best guess of the output variable, we could have the simulator. The simulator is going to run a lot faster and going to allow us to go through many, many more uh, designs. Okay. Okay. <coughs> We can also, the simulator is something that just, it simulates all the physics, forces, or whatever it is that you're trying to do. We can have machine learning speed up the simulator. So if, it, if you're doing simulation on quantum mechanics uh, down at the atomic level, it's going to take hours for something a reasonable sized piece of material. So let's have machine learning learn what this simulator tends to do. It's going to make more, more errors. But that's okay because we can search through more of, a s more of the space, more different designs. Also, the computer simulator is going to make mistakes because it's not the real world. It's just a guess about the real world. It's a better guess than the, simula than the emulator, the machine learning mod model, but it's not as good as the real world. So we're always going to have to come to the real world whenever we design one of these things. But what we're trying to do is speed up the process of designing so that we can go through a lot of designs quickly. And then you can imagine uh, maybe a whole chain of these possible models that are hi higher and higher abstraction. And in each case, there's an opportunity to learn from the, the next more detailed model of the world, uh, include including the real world. So that's a one place we can do the machine learning. Uh, and on the left there is this idea that you can search Maybe at the, at the abstract level, we can search billions of possible designs for this bridge. And then at the emulator level, we can search through millions and then thousands and then present 10 possibilities to the, to the human designer. Okay, that's the, the high level. I'm going to now go into a case study of something that we, we've done at NRC. Uh, this is a fiber optic component. 
the, it's a little schematic there in the upper left where the fiber is coming from Europe. It's coming to a data center in Montreal and we need to get the light signal onto a computer chip. Uh, and this is a special component that because we're down at, at the level of the wavelength of the light, a mirror looks like this. This is essentially a mirror. We want to bounce the light off from the, the fiber and have it sent in a different direction. Okay, how do we design this mirror? Because it's not like the mirrors we know at the, at the big size. We want to design this and as it happens in this case, there are five variables we want to play with. One is how far apart those first two bars are and how long are the bars. That's what those variables are. We could search through the whole space of that and just brute force, let's try it. But that, those are big spaces because it's, those widths could be uh, almost anything. It's a real number. So we're going to try to do it without searching brute force. Now this is, a, this is an idea that I'm about to present to you that applies across all the optimization and machine learning ideas that you have a space you're searching. In this case, let's just imagine two of those variables, the, the L1 and the L2. They're the parameters for the designing this mirror. And for every one of the possible designs in that space of L1 having this value and L2 having this other value, there's a, an efficiency for this device. How much of the light actually gets reflected? What, wh and what we can do is just pick one design. This is, the, this is my first design. I'm going to choose it randomly with L1 and L2 having these certain values. And then I'm going to look around at all of the designs near me. So I've got one point. I did uh, check the efficiency with a, my computer simulator. Now I'm going to do it for all of the ones around me, nearby, and whichever one of those goes up a little bit, so a little higher efficiency, I'm going to take that as my new point in the space. And then I'm going to look around for anything that's higher than my current efficiency, and I'm just going to climb a hill and find the best example near me. Okay, that gives me one of the hills, the top of one of the hills. There are lots of hills that you can see there, so one way to handle that is Let's randomly chart start with a whole bunch of different points and climb all of those hills. Now we've got a list of possible really good answers. And now what we're going to do from that is we've got our original space of five dimensions. And you can uh, easily imagine that it's more than just five dimensions. It's very hard to think of five dimensions. That's why this is only two dimensions and the efficiency is the third dimension. We want to learn what part of this five-dimensional space has high uh, efficiency designs. So we're going to use, in this case, we're going to use something called principal component analysis that figures out part of this, the five-dimensional space that matters, where the good designs are. Now this is a little bit busy, but there's three things. Uh, the, those three bullet points at the bottom, there's one per image. So on the left side is let's choose all our random points and climb up to, that, to the red point, which is a really high efficiency point. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of extra machine learning to find some more of those red points, some really high efficiency uh, designs. Then we'll do this PCA to, to learn a subspace, so not our five-dimensional space, part of that five-dimensional space that has good answers. Everything in that, par that partial subspace has good answers, as far as we can tell. So we've learned in that second uh, image, we've learned here's the subspace where good answers are. Okay. Now with that, we can search that smaller subspace more in more detail. Ra instead of just randomly choosing designs, let's try every design in that subspace. Because we have the time to do that with our simulation. Uh, and that gives us uh, that whole space, an understanding of that whole space, plus whatever the best design is in there. So these are a few steps. The whole point is let's find the best design for that photonic component uh, in terms of efficiency. All right, this is a, a slice of that space, the new space, subspace that we learned. <coughs> 
Um, it, it looks weird, but it just that's what it happened to be. We have no idea what it is. This is what it ended up looking like. The darker the, the color, the, the darker the red, the better the, the efficiency is. <coughs> so we were able to search through that whole space, find out where all the good answers are inside that space of mostly good answers. And we can, uh, so where it says ref 10, that was a previously known design. Somebody else had reported that before we did this search. So they were pretty good. Maybe we didn't need to go through this AI for design thing because they already found one of the best, uh, best uh, designs. However, in addition to the design, we have learned an understanding of where good answers are found. And this is something that the physicists working with us actually understand. It makes sense to them. And uh, so we've learned a little bit of quotation mark science. Uh, we, we like to think that it's science. I don't know if everybody would consider it science, but we've learned an understanding or an explanation for why this is where the good answers are. Uh, in addition, on the, on the right hand side there is the same space again, but now we're going to optimize something different, not the efficiency. So efficiency really matters. But in that space of good efficiency answers, or uh, highly efficient answers, or designs, let's search for the lowest amount of back reflection. So this is light. It can get reflected off a mirror in the wrong direction. We want to reduce that amount of reflection in the wrong directions. And so if you search through that whole space, it's a relatively small space. We can do this in a computer, simulate every one of those possible designs. There's a little uh, blue, it's called design two, a little blue po point there that is in the space of the highest efficiency designs, but also having a low uh, back reflection. So now we have a better answer than had been known before with an understanding of why that, wh why we uh, can search through that, uh, why we can uh, use that answer. All right, that was number one example. I can, if you want to catch me uh, later, we can go into more details about that. Now I'm going to tell you a very different design problem. In this case, we have a heat engine that we'd like to design. If you know the name Carnot, uh, that's where we're heading. All right, so what we want to do is we know that we can, there's this special relationship in gases between pressure and temperature can we use that uh, understanding to create mechanical energy so that we get motion out of heat? Can we turn this into an engine? What do we know? We know that if we have a, a uh, container full of uh, some gas, we can compress it. When we compress it, it heats up. When we decompress it, it cools down. We can add heat to this system and we can put it into a cold bath. So those are all things we can do. H what order do we do those things in in order to get mechanical energy out. Well, let's make it a game. So th those were several different actions I could have done. I could heat up the thing, I can compress it, I can decompress it, I can cool it down, uh, and there are a couple other operations I can do on this. So that sounds like a game. Instead of, in the game of Go, you might put a piece here or a piece there, and we know that AI can be used for, for the game of Go and for other games. Maybe, uh, hopefully you've heard of that. AlphaGo is the name of a computer program that uses what's called deep reinforcement learning to play the game of Go. And they did it better than any human can at the moment. And they also came up with a way that it can train itself without any human help. Uh, so that happens. The same uh, code has also been used for uh, Atari video games where the computer has learned how to play the uh, Atari video games as well as or better than the best human for some games. For some games, are the best human is better than the computer, but I don't know how long that will last. Uh, well and just to give you the, the point at the bottom is what's key about this algorithm. It's, it's a little bit like the magic you heard in the first talk, uh, but what it, what's happening is there are a series of actions. There are lots of things you can do. If, you, if every time you did something you got a, a gold star, you'd know which action was the right one. But in this case, you're in a situation where you don't get the gold star until after lots and lots of actions. And so somehow you have to figure out 
which, uh, how to distribute that gold star to all of the things you did or might have done. And this is a trick for doing that. Uh, it's called deep reinforcement learning. We're using a slightly different uh, system uh, in our current, the, the current version. It's using a little bit of genetic algorithms to help us out. You don't have to worry too much about this equation. The main point is that we're using deep learning and we have several actions we can do. We want to learn for every state that we're in, every situation that might happen in our little heat engine, it tells us what to do. And so we're learning a function, well, the computer program, that says that you tell it, this is what your engine looks like right now, the heat and the pressure and whatever for your gas, uh, this is what you should do now in order to get uh, uh, mechanical energy out. And the types of actions we can do, uh, you can look all of these up, but they're, they're just fancy names for what I said earlier where you can compress. And when you compress <coughs> in an adiabatic way, uh, meaning that you can't, you're not losing any heat, it's going to heat up when you press in and cool down when you will pull out. But you could do the compression inside a fridge where it's really cold and that's isothermic so that it keeps the same temperature uh, or you could do the compression in uh, exposed to heat, etc. So these are all the things that you could do to make this engine. Now, it's gonna look like magic because we're just gonna press a button and it's gonna run through several different possible uh, engines in the computer so it doesn't, we did, nothing blows up or anything. Uh, and then it's gonna come out with an answer that's a very efficient engine. And as, in fact, it comes up with the engine that has been proven to be the most efficient engine, this Carnot uh, heat engine. <coughs> and the, the way you can read that graph on the left is it's a cycle. You're, go you're following down one way and then up the other way, and here's what you do, which action you do in each case in order to maintain this high efficiency uh, transfer from heat into mechanical energy. Or we could, we could restrict its actions and say that you can only do these things. There are certain things you, you can't do. You can't do those adiabatic uh, compressions and, and expansion. <coughs> and in that case, you get a Stirling engine. You can go on Amazon and, and buy a Stirling engine. You can go play with it. Uh, it's about how you get mechanical energy from compressing and decompressing gases. Okay, so those were two examples. We, th they're research papers because we're trying to figure out what's the right way to do, use AI to do design. And we chose those problems because somebody cares about those problems and there's a past understanding of what humans were able to achieve. Can we reproduce or come up with an aid to human designers or human scientists to help them come to those answers quicker? And so we did that in the, uh, in the case of the photonic component. We did it in case of this uh, physics heat engine, but we can do it in, the, in many other circumstances as well. <coughs> and in fact, we can, if, if you have a problem that you can imagine what goes in each of these boxes, it, it's very easy to do this. So you have a design problem. Maybe you have some past existing designs so that gives us a starting point of what it looks like in each of those space, uh, in, in the space of possible searching, uh, uh, sorry, our search space of possible designs. <coughs> um, we also have something inside the computer that allows us to simulate that world fast. It's very easy for us to think about that simulator for physics, uh, for, uh, so there's computational fluid dynamics, so if you want f uh, a fluid moving through something, that's easy. Uh, forces in physics, uh, um, Schrodinger's equation, if you want to go all the way down to the atom <coughs> and include the uh, quantum mechanical effects. It's also possible, we haven't done this yet, and so this is something that, that's coming, uh, and I'll predict it's coming, that your simulator doesn't simulate the physics, but what it simulates is the interaction between uh, agents. So in economy, in an economy or in a smart city. So let's suppose that what you wanted to do was simulate a, 
a micro simulate a city's traffic flow. So you've got a bunch of little cars and you know what's happening with all of the traffic lights. And now what you'd like to do is design the, the traffic, the rules for the traffic lights so that you get the best flow through the city. So there are simulators that do that. It's a huge search space. It's hard to even imagine how many different possible settings you'd have to have for all those rules. But that's okay. Th we don't have to do it. We give it to a computer or a computer cluster and we have uh, 4,000 computers figuring this out for us running 100% uh, of the time. <coughs> um, then at the end, we, we believe that you wouldn't always have, you don't want this to just go uh, and be implemented and built right away. You want to have a human designer come in and say something. So in the case of Auto, Autodesk, they uh, try several different, so they do this random restart on the hill climbing, or in this case it was hill, uh, you're, you're trying to find the lowest amount of material necessary to build a car chassis. And then they try several different starting points, starting designs, find them, keep going lower and lower amount of material. And then they show 10 examples to the human designer and the human designer can say, yeah, oh, that one looks a lot better. Because you don't want to, you won't be able to sell something that looks weird. <coughs> um, but just, just to give another example beyond, uh, it's not, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to have a human in the loop. So w one, one thing that we're trying to build is we've got this computer designer, let's call him it the AI designer. <coughs> let's connect it to the real world where, let's suppose what you're trying to do is weld two pieces of metal together. There wha there's a kind of welding called friction stir welding uh, for aluminum and there are a lot of parameters for how to do this process. There are a lot of steps you could follow, a lot of things you can set, and it's like this game. So let's do this first and this next and this next and this next, and there are a bunch of variables. So it's a design problem. But what we're designing is a process. And let's connect the AI designer directly to a robot that does this friction stir welding and <coughs> also have something that automatically tests the strength after the weld, the electrical conductivity, and anything else we can measure, then the output of that experiment is a bunch of data that comes back to the computer so then it can design better in the future. And then let's just run, let that run. It chooses it, the experiment to run, does an experiment, learns from that experiment, does some thinking, does another experiment, and then becomes an expert in this friction stir welding and comes up with not only the design for right now, but the w best way to do it with new materials or with uh, uh, new parameters on in the welding. <coughs> okay, so that's what I had ready for you today. If you have other questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, if you'd like to contact me by email, I'm joel.martin at nrc.ca. Uh, thank you. <coughs> just a quick question just to um, make it clear. Um, if you could explain the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. <coughs> so uh, neither of those terms is uh, easy to dis distinguish from everything else uh, forever but I'll give you the, the core definition of them. So artificial intelligence means you, that you somehow get a computer to behave intelligently. And there are lots of artificial intelligence programs that were programmed. Somebody sat down and wrote a program to do it. Another way to make a computer intelligent is to collect a lot of examples of the input and output of intelligence. And so one example is, let's say in the bank, you know all of the loans, loan requests that have come in. You know which ones defaulted and which ones were successfully repaid. So a, an intelligent loan adjuster would uh, correctly separate those two. And so you can use machine learning, which is essentially statistics, but a very fancy kind of statistics, to learn a, deci a computer decision-making program to make those decisions in the future. 
So that, that is machine learning and it's used to create intelligent software. The other way to create intelligent software is, is, is to program it. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, uh, what do you think the impact of technology <coughs> uh, actually not trade secrets, but uh, the IPs that companies have developed over the years? And take, for example, headphones. It's a technology that the headphone manufacturers find themselves for a specific way of doing it and years of research. So a company could come, put the model like this in a multi physics setup where you're going, you're coupling um, acoustics with material properties running this with all the properties and in a few days you're able to produce a very uh, competent speaker uh, headphones that would also avoid the patent that a lot of companies have created and this just could create a crazy paradigm in the world in terms of who owns technology and it exists either of the or Yes, that is an excellent question and very foresightful because we are going to go, go there. So uh, let's I'll just take the example of the photonics component I was just talking about. So first we were trying to optimize efficiency and then uh, reduce the back reflection. And there are several things that we're trying to optimize. And it, it, it's easy to quickly add in some more of these, these features that you're going to optimize and then you've overwhelmed the human designers uh, after a very short time. We're also taking into account manufacturability. So when you make a a uh, silicon device down at that low level, there, there are lots of things that can go wrong. And you can get a little bit off uh, in, in building the device and you want to make sure that whichever one of the designs you use, it is the most likely to be manufacturable. Uh, okay, now that's really hard. Uh, that's one step beyond this because we actually have to, we, we have this running, we already ran this, and what you have to do is that for so we're searching through all of those designs and each design we can simulate to figure out the efficiency. Well now for each design, we have to simulate the manufacture of a thousand of those devices in order to figure out the tolerances to manufacture. And then that gives us a score and we want to optimize that. Okay, so easily we can overwhelm human designers in coming up with, with uh, the a best design. Uh, yes, IP is going to be tricky. Uh, maybe it's the people who own the AI that do the design. That's what we're thinking. <laughs> if you own the AI that does this design, then uh, that may be the best place to be. <coughs> Great question. Yes. I just wanted to expand on the uh, first uh, question that the person uh, asked you the question. You're talking a lot about optimization processes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and excuse me for my ignorance, but does the NRC do this only solely for the government or they do it in private for companies consulting and this is the type of thing that you could develop if someone asked you to do such a process or optimization? So, so we have, N NRC is doing these projects for many different purposes. We have partners in the government, we have partners in, uh, in industry. The <coughs> Almost all of the, so NRC is a big organization with a lot of different uh, industry sectors that we work with, so construction and aerospace, et cetera. In every one of those areas, we have many engineers who are helping to design solutions, not only for the government, but also for companies. So we have uh, 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 agreements with many big companies, certainly in aerospace, big companies, and in IT, lots of small companies. And so, yes, we're, we're happy to work with smaller companies that have an idea of how they'd like to use this. We can help you get, get started. We can help you get started with AI. Uh, and uh, we have many ways to work through IRAP at Paris. Uh, so this is the Industrial Research Assistance Program, which is part of uh, NRC. And that's a way that you can engage with NRC researchers. Assistance Program. En français, Paris. Uh, what's it stand for in French? Merci. <laughs> in terms of uh, the accessibility of this uh, technology, where where are we in terms of the maturity? And are, are these very ad hoc for a lab uh, right now? 
and it, it, we don't have a software platform that you know even even earlier than the previous right. question in the previous. Uh, where do you see this? How do you see this evolving? And is is there a chance of having a type of platform that is <coughs> ready to use by the small organizations without going through like a, almost like a lab? Uh, so that that's a great question. Um, I'll start with what's available now to, to, to uh, partially address the earlier question as well. There are many platforms for doing data analytics and machine learning, uh, and I, I can point you in the direction of, of where to find those. The, they are almost ready to use out of the box, but really you're going to need somebody with some expertise to be able to interpret the inputs and outputs and, and understand the statistics necessary for doing something like predicting who's going to default on a bank loan. Uh, so we still need some human expertise. There's a lot here in Montreal. Uh, now, will there be platforms for design? Yes, there will. Uh, they're not there yet. In some, f some fields, that this is already a somewhat common. So in drug design, there are AI tools being used, and there are platforms. Most of them are, you have to go buy them. You can't, they're not open source. Uh, eventually I suspect they will be. Same thing for materials design. So if you're trying to uh, design a lightweight aircraft, you might want new materials, and those new materials will have different properties. How can you design those? A lot of, a lot of companies are already doing that. So when would an open source platform be available? I'm not entirely sure, but I would, I would guess certainly before um, 15 years. I don't know, that's a little while, but. That'll, uh, this what this this idea will be boring by then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's um, closest to the microphone? So I'll do it first. Okay. Um, what's your take on data science and its application with AI and deep learning and all that stuff? Because it seems like for the auditing process, you could probably use like some sort of like data science like techniques to review a system if it's optimal or not optimal. Because, I mean, you, with blind faith, you can kind of say an algorithm is efficient or not efficient to solve a problem. So but what's your take on it? Because right now we're at the, how could I say, the job of the future is, what, data science or something like that? That's like the buzzword right now? Thank you. <coughs> so part, part of this question is, what's the boundary between data science and machine learning or slash AI? And a I think that all data scientists need to know some of the machine learning algorithms. So random forest, if you know data science, you know the term random forest. Random forest is a classification algorithm. Uh, and are you using, it's certainly machine learning. Is it AI if you're doing it? Well, if all you're doing is analyzing some uh, past data and not trying to make intelligent decisions, then maybe it just counts as data science. If you're trying to build a computer program that makes intelligent decisions, Maybe that's when it becomes artificial intelligence. Uh, does that help? Okay. Hi. Um, quick question. You've given us a couple of examples um, about how you use artificial intelligence to design optimal products. Um, have you done that as well um, when it comes to services or processes? Because the, the reason why I'm asking, is I, you, I've been living in the UK for about 18 years and just came back to Montreal. and some of the customer experiences going back to the first speaker that I've experienced are broken at a very basic level where, you know, you go to, a, I don't know, Tim Hortons, you've got long queues all the time. Uh, you go to rent a car and you've got to queue for an hour when actually they should have been able to design the process because it's 100% predictable, um, et cetera. So how does artificial intelligence how can it be used to optimize that sort of process customer experience? So th this, <coughs> at least in my, this is not, this doesn't exist yet. Uh, it seems to me a little bit like that smart city example I gave about the transportation. So Tim Hortons could say, how should we design our restaurants in order to maximize the flow of customers through, through the, the, uh, the, the line? Right now, all they have is data about what currently exists. They also have uh, some, uh, well, I don't know if they have it, but there are some companies that will allow you to simulate 
uh, flow of customers through various uh, lines and things like that. So you, that's a simulator. And so you can, once you've come up with a design, you can look at the simulation and say, yeah, this seems to work. Or we'll try two or three of them and th yeah, these seem to work. So what we're talking about here is let's take that simulator uh, and hope we'll go find the best simulator because there is a lot of variation. We'll have, we'll describe a space of possible designs for Tim Hortons layouts. Uh, there are tables, there are counters, wha whatever. The, somehow we'll, we'll create a space in the computer that's huge, that's maybe trillions of different possible designs for a small restaurant. And then we will, we can't do, once it's up to trillions, we're probably not gonna do brute force and try every single one of them. But we can, s as a, we did for the photonics case, learn where are good solutions in here, where are above some threshold, where are the best ones. Uh, and so that's machine learning, optimization, and simulation to come up with a better design. Uh, that answers, yeah, th we're not there yet. But I can talk about it already. <laughs> Yes. So this is allowing in a way uh, what is typically or in the past uh, a, a, a research lab of a certain size, uh, a team to come up with innovations in whether it's science or technology. How do you see the, the, this, the role of this and whether this will enable having a smaller teams for research and whether this is uh, the possibility of the smaller businesses having you know, research that actually uh, only Bayer and you know, pharmaceuticals can have and does, does, is this going in that direction? So it is a tool that is meant to increase the efficiency of human designers or possibly researchers. I don't want to say we're going to, no researchers going to lose a job. There <laughs> but yes, you could have a smaller team that would be able to move faster. It's about accelerating the de design process. Um, so that's what we'll do. Um, how that plays out, I don't know. And does it mean that one person in their basement is able to capture all the whole speaker market and patent everything? It's a, that's what you need to do. So you need to automate the patenting as well so that you design the, the best few, the best, find the best thousand possible headphones and patent them all uh, if they aren't already patented. So one of the, one of the search characteristics we did besides manufacturability was to uh, what is the patent uh, portfolio that we have access to. So if you do a design, it may that may be the best design, but it mixes people's other people's patents, and nobody's going to ever be able to design that, uh, build that first design. We need to uh, the best design that's possible with our patent portfolio. Um, so that can be part of a design. Thank you.